Well, if you're joining us this morning or, or returning to be with us, uh, let me recapitulate some of what we've been doing in recent weeks. I've been introducing a philosophy of ministry for the Christian church. That if we look to the scriptures, how might they inform us as to the kind of people we are to be and the kinds of things we should be determined to do? Maybe especially as we get out of debt and from that particular financial burden. We will likely be able to do more things, which is very exciting. So what things will we do? There could be a million things that we could choose to do. Well, looking to Scripture and drawing from it principles and goals and purpose that should direct the Christian church, that's one way to try to make decisions in our future. And so in the weeks behind us, uh, what we've done is, is I've introduced what I'll call a threefold purpose. One purpose that has three aspects to it. And that is to be a reaching, nurturing, equipping church that seeks to call God's people to God's worship and God's service in God's world. That's a very packed statement. And so we took a week and we looked at what does it mean to reach. And we saw that that means we believe in evangelism. We believe that God is calling a people to himself. A people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. And only he knows who they are. But we're the means through which he reaches and through which he offers the gospel. His Holy Spirit works through his people. By his word, through his people. And so we want to be that kind of church. We want to be a reaching church that has the mentality that there are people out there throughout the world that need to hear and know the gospel the way you have come to know and believe the gospel. And then secondly... We heard and considered the truth that we're to be a nurturing community. And in Scripture, we see that our children are a priority for the Lord. And they must be a priority in our ministry. They're to be reared in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And so we take the church's children very seriously to love them, to teach them, to encourage them, to correct them. We want to be a nurturing community at GPC. And then the third aspect of that purpose is that we want to be a equipping community. We want our people to be sharpened and equipped for worship and for service. That we don't want to sit in a chair an hour a week and call ourselves good church members. But we have gifts, we have abilities to serve the living God in our six days of labor and when we gather on a seventh day for worship. So we want to be equipped to really serve Him. And then last week I introduced goals, the concept of, okay, we should have goals as a church. There should be things that we're really aiming at. And goals, of course, if I mentioned last week, I'll say it again. If you're coming from a corporate background, you hear goals wait a minute, the church has goals? What would church goals sound like? To enlarge your facility and get bigger and bigger and bigger? To enlarge your membership and your budget and have more and more money and more and more faces? Are those the goals of the church? No, that's not what we mean by goals. We're talking about ministry goals. That our ministry of the word would really lead to something in the lives of our people. And last week, the first goal that I shared was that our membership, our people, would really know Christ. They would really know Him. Not just know about Him. Not just know a lot about the Bible and be walking encyclopedias of historical, biblical times and people. No, 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 no. But to know Christ to really know Him personally and truly. That's our goal, to not know about Jesus, but to know Jesus. And then today, I'll introduce a second goal, and that is that we at GPC, we would be a people who are growing in grace, who are growing in grace in our Christian life and experience. So what in the world... Does that mean? What does it mean to grow in grace? 
Well, here's a few things this morning in our sermon. And we'll start with Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and then 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Give your attention to God's Word. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And then 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord, Jesus, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Let's pray that God would help us understand this concept of growing in grace. <clears throat> Lord, that is our prayer together as a church family, as your word is opened up this morning, as we still our hearts and our minds to come together to look to your word. So would you be our teacher? Would you remind us of true things we've already known to be true? Or maybe even teach us new things that we've not heard or not considered. And may the end result be our growing in grace. Whether children or adults, we ask and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So you may know um, that I have four children. Four beloved children, I should say. Um, and it's a little awkward with them here. Usually in campus ministry, when I would speak of my children, they wouldn't be present. But here's a story from long ago. Um, my oldest now is 23 years old, and um, my youngest is 13 years old. Did I get that correct? 23 and 13. So go way back with me to around birthday number two of the oldest. That would be 21 years ago or so, somewhere around there. It may have been the third birthday, fourth birthday. I just had an idea, and I'm sure I got it from somebody. So I must have seen this, um, but I did have a memory of having something similar in my childhood, and that was a measuring board. Did you have a measuring board in your home where your parents would keep track of how tall you were at a certain age. So I went to the Lowe's and I bought some lumber and I bought some yardsticks and I bought some wooden letters and I guess it was for a birthday present, a Christmas present, I don't remember, but I decorated the boards and I, I put these yardsticks on these eight-foot boards. I was ambitious that I would have very tall children and put their names on it and the, and, the, and the yardsticks. And it was so fun. I don't know who was more excited, if it was me or if it was the kids. But, but each year around their birthday, it would be time to, to mark the measuring board, right? And so as children are born, you make more measuring boards so that each one has their own. And, and then you suddenly have four children, and you don't have room for all these measuring boards. And you you don't keep up with it as the illustration wishes that you did. But the point is the same. If you did this, you have probably a memory, or you can at least imagine with me, the excitement that kids have to see that they're actually growing and to be able to compare where they were at six years of age or ten years of age compared to their siblings, right? I'm taller than you. You were short when you were my age. Right? This, this seeing the evidence of growth excites children and maybe parents too. In my home, it's no different than yours and your memory of, of growing up. Uh, those days where, where suddenly voices start to change. The voices of the boys in the home start to crack a little bit. And they start getting deeper. 
and puberty comes. And um, I still have these on an old iPad, but, but one of my children, uh, we will go back and listen. He, he, he would take my iPad, unbeknownst to me, and he would go and record audio of himself telling stories, hearing his imagination years later in his faint little voice. It's remarkable to see and hear how much people change. Uh, as we grow, we transform, we mature, we become different creatures. And you've seen this, you know, little boys in your home suddenly having feet as big as yours and being able to wear your shoes all of a sudden. Um, when my dad passed away two years ago, it was my job to go and, and to, to help clean out closets, which, you know, is just an emotional and difficult thing to do uh, related to the, the loss of a loved one. But I brought home all these clothes, and, and my boys can fit into them. How can my little boys fit into clothes that fit my father? It's because they're growing up. And it can happen so fast, seemingly, so suddenly, you didn't notice it, right? Have you had this experience where you're like, I didn't realize my kids had grown up so much, but then we came back to church after a pandemic and saw people we hadn't seen for months, and some kids had grown six inches, right? I could name them. I won't. Growth is happening around us all the time. Sometimes we notice it. Most times, we don't. But Christians are to grow in a similar kind of way. We're supposed to grow spiritually, which in some ways is visible, and in other ways it's not. So this morning, a sermon on growing in grace. That's the Bible's language. You've heard it from 2 Peter 3. The language of transformation that we are becoming something that we're not already or naturally, and that ultimately we are being transformed, here's the deal, into someone new, someone different, a different kind of person or people than we already were. That's the story of Scripture, and it's a beautiful one. It's connected to the gospel, and my hope is we'll see it and marvel over it and grow in it more and more this morning. So first, the call to grow in grace. The call to grow spiritually, to grow in grace. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Again, it said this, Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and now and to the day of eternity. Amen. What does it mean to grow in grace? Well, in the way of context, I didn't include this in the reading originally because I, I thought it would be confusing and I could comment on it here. So the passage just before 2 Peter 3.18, 2 Peter 3.17, says this, Be on your guard. Watch out. Be warned so that you will not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure standing. Okay, so it comes with a warning. Just before we're told to grow in grace, we're told this. Christians, be careful. Be warned. Because in this life and in this world, and even within the church, there are going to be some fine-sounding teachings that can lead you astray. They're going to sound good and worth following, but they will lead you astray, and once led astray from the gospel of grace, you will fall. You will collapse. And so the call is to not do that. Don't be led astray by fine-sounding teaching, but stay rooted in the gospel by growing in grace. That's the context of it. It comes with a warning. Don't do this, but do this. Don't be led astray by fine-sounding teaching, which will make you fail and fall. Instead, go in a direction, grow in the direction of grace and knowledge of Christ and His gospel. Charles Spurgeon, in his sermon on this text, 
says, he asks the question, so what does it mean to, to grow in grace? And he said, you know, he said, it makes me think of a child and his toys, or we'll say a bicycle. You teach a child to ride a bicycle, put him on a bicycle, what's the worst thing he can do? To try to stay still. You're going to fall and fail. You have to keep moving forward to not fall and fail. That's Spurgeon's illustration of what it means to grow in grace. It's to keep moving forward, to not be led astray by voices that say, slow down, pause, take it easy. Because a child, you've done this, you've fallen and skinned your knee, right? A child on a bike, if you try to stop pedaling, stop moving forward, you're going to fall and you're going to fail. I think Spurgeon is right. It's a helpful illustration. So in our lives, we're called to grow in grace, to keep persevering, to keep moving forward in our profession, to keep showing up where we need to show up in order to grow up, right? And that really is the challenge often in growing in grace because... Life gets busy. We want to stop pedaling. We're too busy to pedal. We have places to be. I can't pedal right now. And the call to grow in grace is to keep pedaling. Keep showing up where God and His Word and His grace can be found. And those things will grow you. Now in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, uh, a comment is made about the growth in Jesus' life. And this passage has always amazed me. I've used it frequently when talking about these subjects. But it's the passage that just seems to summarize in a sentence uh, years of Jesus' life. It's kind of like a fast-forward button capturing in one sentence the truth of what has happened for Jesus. And it says this, And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and favor with man. I want you to think about that. What, what's going on there? Well, it's quite simply giving us an understanding of how they understood people grew. And it's making up for this period in Jesus' life, saying he has matured. He has become a man. So how is a man to grow? What are the expectations we should have for one another? How did Jesus grow? Well, he grew in wisdom. He grew in stature. He became a man. He got taller. His feet got bigger. His shoulders got wider. And he grew in favor with God. He grew spiritually as a man. And he grew in favor with man. He grew socially. He grew relationally. And so really, this is a physical, intellectual, social, spiritual dynamic of what it means to be a person. Some of that growth is going to happen naturally. You're going to grow physically. Kids, you're going to get taller. Your feet are going to get bigger. You're going to get hair on your legs. But some of that growth requires intentionality and discipline and God the Holy Spirit being at work in your life. And so to grow, Jesus grew in that fourfold way, and so we are too. And, and really, quite simply, that's what I think human flourishing looks like. It's when we grow in all four of those categories. When we grow as we should. When we don't have stunted growth in some of those categories. But we're growing as whole persons, whole people, right? I used to work at an institution that would talk about human flourishing. We never really defined it. But I think this is how the scriptures define it. It's to grow as full-orbed, fully dimensional people in our relationship with God and with man. So what about our growth? And that's really what we're concerned about, right? Are we growing as we should? Am I growing as I should? Well, the scriptures talk about growth, and our theology from scripture talks about growth. And I want to highlight that this morning. Westminster Shorter Catechism number 88, the question and answer system that helps us understand biblical teaching. It says this, The outward and ordinary means, the usual way, by which Christ communicates His benefits of redemption to us are His ordinances, 
But here it is. But especially, especially the word, the sacraments, and prayer. These are all made effectual to the elect for salvation. Now, it's a lot of words, but what I want to zero in on there for your good and for mine and for our church family's good is, do you believe that's true? Do you believe that of all the ways that God could grow Christians, I mean, He could just have us walk along and strike us with a laser beam from heaven, and all of a sudden we know Him more, we know the Bible more, we want to pray more, we love people more. He could do it by laser beam, so to speak. There's no expectation in us for that. He has an ordinary means by which we grow. It's as ordinary as if you eat healthy food, chances are you're going to grow in a healthy way. If you take in the nutrients that your body needs, it's going to grow. And God has said that spiritually, He nourishes us through His Word, through the sacraments, and through prayer. Not the only three, but the most ordinary, usual three. The things tangibly that we can experience and do together. And so if we want to grow in grace, part of that equation is you need the Word, you need Scripture, the Bible, you need it in your life. Now there's all kinds of ways to get the Bible in your life. This is one very important one. This is when we gather in community. We really don't do this outside of this time. But we can hear God's Word and we can grow in ways that we wouldn't if we were at home by ourselves. Right? So it's something special where God works in the life of His people and His church. And it's a good thing. But you can read your Bible at home. You can listen to your Bible uh, on your ears and go for a walk or go for a bicycle ride. There are other ways to get God's Word in you. This one's very special that God's given His people. But he's given us his word, and there's all kinds of ways we can be exposed. We are wise when we commit ourselves to that. And then the sacraments. Now, can't do the sacraments at home. We do those together in community as a church. But we take those seriously. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. And when we gather for the Lord's Supper, it's not just this routine that we're supposed to do every once in a while. We really believe God is communicating... He is reminding, He is teaching us what He has done for us in Christ. And it is beautiful, it should be beautiful, and it should be very meaningful. And so we take that very seriously in our church family as a means of grace. We expect God to be at work through those ordinary means. And then, of course, prayer. And you know how hard it is to pray on your own. Some of you are very disciplined, and you have a very blessed prayer life. Others of you struggle and struggle greatly. There are groups that come together and pray. Archie would tell you, uh, Randy, what, 6.30 on Monday mornings? Where's Randy? Randall. 6.30 on Monday mornings, 6.45? About 6.45 Monday mornings, there's a group of men that come to the church and meet and pray. If your schedule allows, they would love for you to come and pray with them and learn to pray with them. Our women get together. Hopefully in your homes you have some kind of prayer time. But we pray together as a church family too, as we did in the pastoral prayer this morning. So the word, sacraments, and prayer, have you thought too little of those things? Can you purpose to make more diligent use of those things? I think it's true, just as some of us physically, maybe we were slow to grow. Uh, Some of you saw your classmates get taller than you, faster than you. Some of you waited. You felt like your growth was stunted. This is not normal. This is all ordinary. Some people grow, give the appearance of growth, and they're tall, but they hadn't really grown up on the inside, right? There's all kinds of ways to consider growth and whether or not it's happening. But our duty is to make sure we're doing the things we're supposed to do in order to grow, lest we stunt our own growth or starve ourselves from growth knowingly or unknowingly. And it's possible to do both. So God's given us a means of growth. The means of growth are the means of grace. And God the Holy Spirit alone is the one who can make those 
effective. We just need to show up and pray and trust that he will grow us as he's pleased to. Okay, now, a word about this. As I, as I put those thoughts together this week, I thought to myself, you know, physical growth is most evident between those years of what? 11 to 15? Something like that is where you see profound growth uh, in a child, in the human body. Spiritual growth, like intellectual growth, mental growth, like emotional growth, those tend to be more robust in growth during those years of, I don't know, 18 to 25. And I've worked with that population a lot, and I've seen it. I've, I've seen boys who came to the college campus, and they leave young men. Their emotions have changed. Their bodies have changed, but their thinking has changed. And the most beautiful thing to see is spiritual growth where somebody has categories that they didn't have when they went away from home. Spiritual categories of faith and life, knowledge of Christ, knowledge of His Word. And so growth happens in all kinds of ways, and that intense growth tends to happen in those years of 18 to 25. Now, why do I emphasize that? Because most of you are not age 18 to 25. Some of you still have a season of robust growth to come. Because maybe it didn't happen between ages 18 and 25. Maybe you didn't find the church and find Christ until you were 40 or 50. And so there are a lot of growing pains and a lot of growth that can still happen for you. Where God's word and spirit are at work in you. But those of you who did grow a lot from ages, say, 18 to 25. I want to highlight this. I have found that a lot of people are like, you know, I used to be excited about growing, but it's like I got my growth spurt behind me, and I don't have a big splash of growth. And you know, there's, tr- there's some truth to that. To you, I want to say this. Keep moving forward on your bicycle. The real challenge for those of you who maybe went through a a season of growth to maturity behind you is to keep showing up. Even though you're not seeing or maybe feeling the tremendous spurt of growth that wowed you early on in your Christian faith. But what if your 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s are simply God calling you to persevere, to continue on, to not grow weary in doing good. This morning, I assume there's some of you that need to be encouraged in that. That you could say, well, I already know all that. I know that I don't want to go to Bible study. I've already studied this. Or I don't want to go to church. You know, I know every hymn already. I've read the Bible several times. The challenge for you is to grow in grace by showing up, by carrying on, by persevering. I had a seminary professor who marked me for life years ago when he spoke about apathy towards worship that can come in the life of those in ministry. An apathy towards devotional life. An apathy towards prayer. And concerning worship, he said this. He said, men... You just need to remember now and forevermore. When God's people gather for worship, there is no other place for you to be if you're a worshiper. There is no other place for you to be when God's people gather for worship. When the alarm is rung that we're gathering, the call to worship is going to be heard, we're there. There's no other place for us to be because we've got to prioritize words, sacraments, and prayer. Otherwise, we're going to stunt our growth. We're going to stop pedaling our bikes, and we'll fail, and we will fall. Amen? So if if some of this feels like, my growth was behind me, keep pedaling your bicycle. Let me plug for a moment here the Men's Fellowship this Thursday. Ages 12 and up. If you're a 12-year-old young man, you're invited to the Men's Fellowship because you're a future man. 
and we want you to be with us. We want to encourage you. We want you to grow in grace. We want you to see it normalized that men get together, read Scripture, talk about the Bible, and pray. Oh, and by the way, we'll be having breakfast for dinner. That only helps. So 6 o'clock to 8 p.m. we'll be in the youth room. Um, I'm going to give a devotion, but I've also got a special guest who's going to speak for a few minutes targeting the younger men. So if you're age 12 and up, uh, I don't want you to think this is just for the old men. It's for you too, okay? we got to show up to grow up. All right, secondly, really that was all one point. That was too long, sorry. Uh, Two more points quickly. That inward work of being transformed. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Let me read that again briefly. Quickly. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Everything about the world in which you and I live is wanting us to conform. It wants us to conform our thinking. It wants us to conform our beliefs. It will force that on us. It will twist our arm. It will try to redefine what the scriptures have said about things like marriage, family, gender, and sexuality, just to name a few things that are coming up in our Sunday school hour. But we're not to conform to the world. God has given us His Word, and His Word and Spirit transform our minds. They transform our thinking. And so our thinking has to be renewed. It has to be renewed by God's Word and by God's Spirit. So there is an inward work within the life of a believer. And we can fan those flames of transformation by showing up to grow up, by being in the places and doing the things that God has said is for our spiritual health and for our strength. The bottom line is that our thinking, the way you think, matters to God. He cares how you think. So much so that He's given you His Word that you might know how to think and what to think by knowing Him through what He's revealed of himself. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Every thought captive, every random thought, every, every whispering idea that comes into our lives we take it captive and put it back in its right place in obedience to Christ and to God's Word. That takes intentionality on your part to take those thoughts captive, to not let them run astray in your mind and in your heart, but to take them captive that they would not take you captive. Amen? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 The scriptures call us to this transformation, this change, in a way described as having uh, occurring more and more, more and more, more and more. And here's what we have concerning the nature of progressive sanctification. That God is concerned not that you pray a prayer and change for a day, but that God is in the work of changing you throughout your life conforming you and conforming me and conforming us more and more into his image, more and more into his likeness. It's progressive. It starts like a little seed, and that seed gives root and grows into what could be a beautiful, strong, and healthy, and fruitful tree that would be your life. That's how God is at work. It's more and more taking every thought captive, taking every action and putting it in obedience to Christ. This transformation in the Christian life that is so rarely spoken of 
It is such a whole person, such a full-orbed change that the Holy Spirit does in us. It's, it's been summed up this way. I think this is helpful. It is a progressive change in us that affects our head, our heart, and our hand. Everything that we are, our thoughts, our passions, and our doings. That God is concerned with head, heart, and hand. And we're to grow as whole people, experiencing growth in our thinking, experiencing enlarged hearts, so to speak, where we learn to have passions that glorify God. Our loves are directed by His ultimate love. And then our hands want to do the things that He calls us to do. So consider your head, your heart, and your hand. At Greenwood Presbyterian Church, we want all three. We want a full-orbed growth for our church family and for all of our members. And we should be creating opportunities for you to grow in all three of those kinds of ways. More on that in the weeks to come. Thirdly and lastly, all of this together results, it should result in you becoming someone new, a new creature, a new creation, not the same as you used to be. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. I didn't read this earlier. I'll read it now. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. And that is to say, this progressive sanctification, this progressive change that God's Word and God's Spirit are working in His people, it's not for some people. It's not for varsity Christians while JV Christians go unchanged. It's for all of God's people. And we're to be conformed more and more into this new person that He's making us to be. We think differently. Our passions are different. Our service is transformed. The things we do with our time, all of it is redefined and redirected by God Himself and in a way that we enjoy. Not in something we're miserable with and we hate, but he gives us a desire to do new things, to be a new kind of person. And he does it to the whole person, the head, the heart, and the hand. Again, the shorter catechism and its question and answers, it asks the question of sanctification, which is really the subject of all of this. And it says this, what is sanctification or what is this growth in grace? And the answer is this, sanctification or growth in grace is the work of God's free grace whereby we are renewed in the whole man, the whole person after the image of God. And we are enabled somehow more and more to die to our sin and to live for righteousness. That's the work of God within his people. Not some of his people, but all those who truly call on the name of Christ. We're to become new people. And we should be able to look back and say, you know, I, I am a different person. Had a temper, had a mouth, had a sloppiness, had a laziness, was unethical. It's a different person. But God slowly, not all at once, slowly but surely by his word, by his people, like sandpaper rubbing some rough piece of wood. He's been shaping me year after year after year, and that's the work of God. That's growth in grace. That's what happens to us when God's grace surrounds us and when often we show up where we need to be in order to grow up into the kind of people that he's calling us to be. So how does this growth happen? How does sanctification happen? How does growth in grace happen? All right, so it's not by laser beams. I think we're agreed on that. Word, sacraments, and prayer, that's the ordinary means. But here's the fuller story that we know from our own experience and that we know from Scripture. Oftentimes, the most profound spiritual growth in your life and in mine, 
and in the testimony of the saints in Scripture and in church history, it comes through suffering. It comes through hardship. It comes through loss. It comes through disappointment. It comes through struggle. The most intense and deep-rooted growth tends to come through seasons of hurt and seasons of pain. So that's not a real exciting thing to preach, but it's true. It's true. God uses our hardship and our suffering for our good. Growth tends to not come in the way that we thought that it would, but it's always for our good. I want you to think about that from your own experience, from your own life, and to be bolstered by it for whatever is coming next. Our mentality should be, whatever this day brings, it may be hard, it may be good, but God will make it for my good. And I can rejoice in Him. So, close with a real story. Let's tie all this up and put a bow on it from real life, shall we? So, 2022, wow, what a year. Just a couple of weeks in. So I've had a plumber out to my house six times in 2022. We have had leaks, we've had clogs, we have had septic problems. We have found we have a severe water problem under our house and a severe mold problem under our house, dry rot under our house to the point that we have to have 42 joists replaced. Yeah, that's right. Some of you know what that means. That's bad news. (laughs) Count it all joy, brothers and sisters. (laughs) We're growing in grace. So so just as a snapshot, um, and I mean that, by the way, that is my conclusion to the sermon. I mean that, but I didn't feel that on Monday. (laughs) Right? So on Monday, this is the sixth time I had called a plumber, and the first of three times I would call septic services and uh, I called somebody to get some help. He said, yeah, we're, we're kind of caught up. Uh, we're not going to be able to help you. I'm sorry, I'm talking like Abbeville County. You're, uh, we're not going to be able to help you anytime soon. But the guy said, why don't you call Chunky? I said, Chunky? Some of you may know Chunky. Uh, Chunky? Tell me about Chunky. Well... Chunky can fix anything. There's hope. Chunky can help me. So he gives me, my plumber gives me the name of Chunky. And so I call Chunky. Hello, Chunky. I'm Paul Patrick. <laughs> Got a problem over here. And he's on a, he's on like a tractor or something. I can hardly hear him. And he's like, I can't figure out how to cut this off. <laughs> okay, Chunky, you're my hope. <laughs> I need you to at least find a way to cut the tractor off because I've got a bigger task for you. So Chunky gets on the phone, and I describe to him what's happening. And he says, Mr. Patrick, you got a bad, bad problem. And I can't get to you for a month either. Everybody's backed up, by the way. So my my news on Monday is Chunky tells me I'm backed up, and he can't help me for a month or more. And he says, you can try calling other people. Let me know if you can't get them. So I'm pulling my little bit of hair out, and I'm frustrated. And then I remember, I'm preaching on growing in grace next Sunday. (laughs) Preach the sermon to yourself before you preach it to people, right? And I remembered a story I think I've told you before from years ago where a, a ministry acquaintance of mine, newly married, had his air conditioning system break down. And, you know, that's a big expense, a $20,000 expense. And he was grumbling to an older minister. And sometimes we like to do that, and we like people to resonate with us, right? Boy, it's bad. You got it real bad. Sometimes that's all we think we want to hear. But that's not what that minister said to him, and it's not what I let myself say to myself after a few minutes. But the older minister said to him, what I learned to say to myself is, After he heard how bad his situation was, he said, Now why would you suppose God loves you so much that he would let your 
heating and cooling system breakdown so that he can somehow show you his goodness. Isn't it amazing that God could use a little disaster like that to show you how good he can be? Brace yourself for it, because he's going to show you his goodness. And of course, we heard that story, and I was like, oh, i got to remember that. So I had that little talk to myself. Somehow, God is going to prove his faithfulness to his people. It's a septic tank. We're privileged to have septic tanks in our country. We don't have those everywhere. And so for you, if you've been devastated by some curveball, disappointment, bad news, suffering, hardship, thing you didn't see coming, count it all joy. This is how God ordinarily grows us in grace. By prying from our own little hands what we wanted or thought we needed and showing us his sufficiency. Oh, it's never fun to go through that, but that's, that's what he does. And so I'm going to pray for us, and I'm sure you're dealing with, with similar things. It might be your health, it might be your vehicle, it might be your job, it might be your co-workers, it might be anything. But we're going to close with a hymn from John Newton, who himself knew a life of suffering, who put all these truths of growing in grace together in a hymn so that we might sing them and find hope in the gospel itself. But as we sing this hymn of asking the Lord to grow, and that growth coming in a way we never saw coming, as he purposed to take out of our hands our idols and to show us our sinfulness, but then to show us his glory and his mercy to us. That's the rhythm of the hymn we're going to sing. Let it be near and dear to your heart as it reminds you of the truth that we're called to grow in grace, and that often hurts, but it's always for our good. Just keep moving and pedaling on your bicycle. Don't stop showing up lest you fall and you fail. Let's pray together. Lord, would you bless us by faith as we look to you, learning to trust you, believing that our lives aren't happenstance, they aren't built on luck, but you are the divine orchestrator, sovereign over all the affairs of your world. And so, Lord, give us faith in Jesus. Give us faith in you and your word and your promises to your people that you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us. And in the end, we really are going to be more than okay. We give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen.